Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I'm Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. Before we're joined by our guests today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation today is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given over $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. So if you are a SAG after artist and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guests. We have Maggie Gyllenhaal of The Lost Daughter, Janixa Bravo with Zola, Christy Wilson Cairns from Last Night in Soho, Sean Hader of CODA, and Rebecca Hall of Passing. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because I literally just ran off my favorite movies of the year and you're all here. I realized that was like my, my personal top five. Um, so I always like to start at the beginning and ask people kind of how they got started. What was your, when did you first consider yourself a writer? Like, were you someone who, you know, was writing stories as a child or, you know, what was the first thing that made you feel like, you know, you were a professional? Where did it sort of begin for you? And let's start with Janixa. Uh, I was thinking that the answer of when I thought I was a professional versus when I thought I was a writer, those moments aren't in parallel, right? I feel the moment of thinking I'm a professional is when somebody else is paying me, when there's a check and I'm like, oh, wow, there's a check. That means that means it's a job, right? Or that means it's real. Uh, someone else is validating uh, this illusion uh, that's been inside of my head, right? Uh, regarding the moment of feeling like I'm a writer, I think that I arrive at it out of uh, because there's some kind of gap or, or a hole, meaning I want to just be a director for hire. I'm a theater. I'm a theater kid. I went to theater school and, you know, I want to direct the classics. And when I think of myself moving into the film space, I'm waiting for someone to give me a script to direct. But it doesn't work like that, uh, or at least it didn't for me. And so wanting to if I wanted to do that, what I needed to do was create the work for myself. So uh, then it, there was a, you know, a resume of sorts, or it meant that there was, I could have a kind of CV to show that I could do it, right? A proof of concept. And so the moment of arriving at being a writer is having to write for myself. And again, it becomes that the first thing I'd written that felt really legible was a short film and it got into South by, and it, again, it was this feeling of validation that made me feel like maybe I could call myself a writer. I still wasn't all the way ready, but there were a few more yeses. And then I felt I could call myself that, but even sometimes now I feel a bit shy around it. Really? Even now? Yeah, because I feel I'm a storyteller and storytelling you know, I work a good deal in television and it's on work that isn't mine. And I still feel very open to working on work that isn't, you know, penned by me. And so I feel I'm a storyteller first and that can manifest itself in direction and or, you know, by pen. Absolutely. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. I was hoping this would be uh, centered on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that someone else could direct your your work that you write? I would love that. I would love that. Do I think they can? I feel I tonally write so much to my own kind of, you know, ca I, I'm calibrating to my own peculiarities. That's but what I, I mean, because you say you're a storyteller. Like, that's a, do you, are you writing for yourself only or could you write like so someone else could do it? Sorry, I go ahead. I think I could. I think I could. I would hope that whoever was going to direct my writing would have a, a pass at doing the script themselves in the way that I would, if I was going to direct someone else's text, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So interesting. Christy, what about for you? Where did it all begin with you? Um, I mean, I'm still quite surprised I get to call myself a professional. Every time someone pays me, I'm like, those idiots. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, I kind of fell into it by accident. I'm really dyslexic. I can't spell. So I'm like I'm already not a good writer. But I am. Um, when I was 15, I walked past a film set in Scotland and I'd only ever watched films and suddenly one was getting made. And so I just wandered onto the set and started asking questions. And then somehow, you know, 10 odd years later, someone started paying me 
to come up with stories. And I used to just make stuff up in my pajamas, hand it over to people, and then they'd go and make a film. I suppose I, I only ever feel like I'm a professional when I'm on set and someone turns to me and is like, we need to change this. Can you do this now? And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Because uh, the rest of the time, I just sort of feel like I'm playing uh, alone in my room. Um, so, yeah, it's quite it's quite strange. But, yeah, and I, and I never felt like I was a professional writer until I finally had, like, a produced credit. Because I'd worked for, like, 10 years in, like, TV and everything like that and, and you know, in film, and it's quite hard to get film made, um, as we're all aware. And, yeah, it wasn't until, I think, I saw a poster for 1917 on the IMAX in Leicester Square, and I was like... Oh, I'm I'm really doing this. This is my job. <laughs> that was your first produced credit? Yeah, I know. I'm very surprised. <laughs> That's amazing. So your first produced credit out of the gate, nominated for Best Picture, winning all kinds of awards. You're like... I, I assume they're all like this. I assume just every single one. Um, no, no, I, I got very lucky. And also I, I work with like really lovely, very talented people. So that certainly helps. <laughs> Sean, what about for you? Um, I mean, if I think back on being a kid, I, you know, I used to throw very elaborate birthday parties when I was a kid where I would send out like character breakdowns for everyone coming to the party. And they would be these really elaborate murder mysteries where people would have to like learn their character and come in character and stay in character the whole party. This is when I was like 10, 11. Um, and I would always get murdered at the party. And then I would go change clothes and put on a bald cap and come back as a detective and interrogate everyone and solve the murder at my own party. Like, so, so if I look back, I'm like, of course I was doing this when I was a kid, but I, I mean, I was an actor. I was like a theater kid, like as Janixa was saying, and I, you know, went to theater school and came out of school and was working as an actor. Um, the first screenplay I wrote was because I was, I was bartending in LA and in my twenties. And I remember guys would come into the bar and they'd be like, so what do you do? And I'd say, I'm an actress. And they would sort of have this slight look of pity on their face, you know, and they'd say, Oh, have you been in anything I would know? Or have you, you know, and I was so tired of it. I was just like, this is exhausting. Like, I just don't want to keep saying this for some reason. And one night I just lied and I was like, I'm a writer. And, uh, and this guy said, Oh, what are you working on? And I just literally bullshit, you know, and I told him this story of something that had happened to my neighbor. And he was like, that's a really good idea for a movie. And, and I remember leaving work and being like, it is a good idea for a movie. Like I should write that as a movie. And I kind of just did it. Like I, I had never really written a screenplay before. I kind of was like, I just want to try this. And I wrote this screenplay. And I remember um, Zach Quinto is one of my oldest friends from college. And I sent it to him when I was done very, you know, with a lot of vulnerability, like, I don't know, I wrote this thing. I just felt like I wanted to try writing a movie and he read it and he was like, you're a writer, you know, like, I think, I think you're really a writer. And, but again, like, as everyone's saying, it takes a long time to feel that way, you know, and you sort of, and I started going to this group. Um, it was at St. Nick's pub in LA where writers would come in and bring pages that they were working on and actors would show up and cold read those pages. And I really was going as an actor and cold reading other people's work. And then I started feeling like I want to bring in my own stuff. And I brought in a scene I had written um, and, you know, heard it read aloud and heard the audience response in the pub with all these people and, and heard people laugh and talk about it afterwards. And, and that was the first time I was like, I want to make that into a film. And that was my first short film mother that I made out of that scene. I applied to AFI with it and, and made that film through AFI. Um, but again, it was always a tool because I wanted to direct. And I always felt like I had to trade that as Janixa said, like I was holding the writing so that somebody would give me a chance to direct um, and then of course, while I was trying to get my first feature made, I started writing for television. So then I really was a writer and then I was writing for other people all the time and, you know, writing episodes and, and watching other directors bring them to life and, and then felt like, oh, this is something I am a professional. I do this, you know, this is something that, um, and there is something about that, like seeing someone else direct your work that makes you realize oh, I, I'm not just a writer-director. I also can write in a way that can facilitate 
someone else looking at what I've written and understanding how to make it. So I don't know, it was a journey, but it, it was, it's hilarious actually when I think back that it all started from like this lie at the bar because I just didn't feel, <laughs> didn't feel like explaining that like I got raped on law and order. You know, I was like, I just don't want to <laughs> go through like all of like the, the shitty guest spots I've done. I just want to tell this guy that I'm something that sounds intellectual and maybe will make him stop talking to me. But then that was the thing that kind of, got it brewing for me and made me think, well, actually I am a writer and maybe I should do that. And I assume you gave that guy 20%. I you. mean, <laughs> what happened to that guy is a whole other story. That we <laughs> tell <him that. laughs> I got to hear this. Yeah, that. It's a story for after the, after this panel. Wow. Okay. Something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, what about for you? Because obviously you had quite a successful, look, I'm putting it in the past tense. You have quite a successful career as an actor. Had you always been interested in writing and directing? Was that always the plan? Um, no, I, I think um, now that I look back on, on it, I think it's clear to me that I always was um, a writer and a director, I think, but I, 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 the world I was living in, the way I was thinking, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but I think I didn't, um, I didn't feel entitled to even really want that. I, um, I, there were a lot of models around me of really interesting, intelligent, expressive storytelling actresses. And there were very, very few um, uh, women who were directing around me. My mother is a writer. So, I mean, like I, that, that certainly was an option and a possibility, but like that alone, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that would do it for me, like just to write. Uh, for me, it's very, very tied. And I, the reason I was, I was sort of asking you that, I, I wonder what my scripts would feel. I mean, I think I would find it very difficult to hand my script off to someone else to direct, but also I don't, I, I think so much of what I write is, um, well, I don't know. It's tied to directing for me, but I, I think then what, what happened is I've always been somebody who ha who figures out what I think through writing, um, not 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 writing journals and things like that, but even writing an important email or um, a speech I have to give, or um, I I give myself the space to think by taking some time and writing it down. And um, it was a real risk for me to take on this adaptation and pick it up and see if I could do it. And it was really kind of one foot in front of the other, but I do have to say, I think, and I wonder for the other actresses involved here, if you, if, if you relate to this at all, I feel like particularly in terms of an adaptation um, that the same muscle that's used uh, in acting where you have a text and it is your job, if you are a kind of storytelling directorial type of actor, which are my favorite kind of actors, you know, as an actor, you have a text and you have to figure out what is the event of this scene? What is the purpose of this scene? What is the reason? What must happen in this scene, no matter how it's expressed or else it's a useless scene? And, and in fact, like that, figuring that out, um, and it can change no matter, you know, I can choose a different event than Rebecca could choose and she and I could be acting in a scene together and it could be different than what our director thinks it is. But, but like, for example, what I, what I mean is like you could write a scene about two people ordering lunch at a restaurant and they're talking up here, but really what is the scene about? Is it an apology? Even if no one ever apologizes, is it a seduction? Even if no one ever really literally comes on to anyone else, what is the purpose of it? And sorting that out is what makes for good acting. And also I think is the same job you need in order to do an adaptation. And then after you've figured that out in an adaptation, I think the question is like, how do you then make it cinematic? And mm -hmm. To me, I'm like not, a, I'm not ever interested in watching a movie or making a movie where the, the, um, the event or the purpose is expressed literally in the scene. And that's, I think, what makes it cinematic, right? Is that you're, you're having to work to figure it out. You're having to use a whole nother language to figure out what that would be. So 
I don't know. I mean, for me also, I just have to say about writing, like when you're acting, even though you're doing similar things, you're using similar muscles, it's all happening very fast and it's all a collaboration and you're, you're having to negotiate the politics of the set you're on the, you know, you know, respecting the other people who you're working with, all the interesting ideas coming at you. And when you're writing, I found it so exciting (laughs) that you have as much time as you need and it's all your own mind having the space to explore i mean for me when i was when i was writing i felt like it was like totally a gift i really enjoyed it you know i felt like it if i fell into something that actually felt more natural to me in some ways than acting well rebecca also a very busy actor i just watched night house last night which was fantastic by the way (laughs) i'm sorry i know i'm behind um and you're also making your directorial debut with passing was writing something that you have been doing the whole time or uh is it something you discovered recently no it's not something i discovered recently i think you know i chime with a lot of, of what everyone's been saying i think that the sort of understanding yourself to be a writer versus a professional writer is a very different kind of thing. I mean, I also think of myself as a painter and I also think of myself as a musician, but I'm not ever going to be any of those things professionally. Um, And nor am I probably ever going to be just a writer. It is a means to an end for filmmaking. And I think filmmaking is how I incorporate all the things I'm interested in. But I, I did always privately think of myself as a writer. The sort of, for want of a... I don't know, less buzzworthy word, the flow state that sometimes you can get in, that sometimes I can get in as an actor, I have always been able to readily achieve as a writer. And it's very much my happy place. And it's and it's how I've processed and interpreted and understood the world forever. But similarly to what Maggie was saying, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, my father was a very famous theatre director and, you know, I knew Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard. They were around, (laughs) you know, I didn't think of myself as a writer. I was like, no, those people are writers. Like, I'm just, you know, yes, okay, I spend maybe, you know, six hours of my quiet private time as an only child, like scribbling away and writing stories and, and journals and poetry and everything under the sun. But do I think of myself as a writer? No, 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 certainly not. So I do think of myself as a writer now, but it's a path to finding how it, can express itself professionally, which has got to this point. So you never asked Harold Pinter to read anything when you were a kid? No, I did not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All of your films are so fresh and unique. I I really want to talk about where sort of the initial idea came from and how you developed your movies. And I'd love to start with Sean because you're actually adapting a French film. Um, But what captured your interest about the story and made you imagine it, you know, set in a Massachusetts fishing town? So I knew that town really well. I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my mom's best friend lived up in Gloucester, and we had lots of family friends up there. And so in the summers, we would go up there. And that town always captured my imagination because it's a there's a lot of juxtapositions happening. It's kind of this quintessential, beautiful New England town with this rocky coastline and gorgeous vistas. And and yet it was this very working class place that had all this grit to it. And and certainly the people there, the North Shore fishermen guys and and the vibe of the town and and the feel of those characters. And so when I was initially approached, I had made Tallulah my first film and I was looking for another film. And and when I was approached about the idea of a remake, it was kind of like, oof, I don't know that I would want to like, why make another person's movie again? And is it, you know, especially with a foreign film, it's like, why would you do it just to put it in English or, but then when I watched the film, I was, I was very moved by this character at the center. I was moved by um, the idea of seeing a deaf family on screen because I had never seen that before in a film. Um, And I was also struck that in the French film, they used hearing actors to play those parts. There was not a real exploration of ASL on screen. The the hearing character spoke through the entire movie. So she spoke to her parents and she said all of their lines out loud, you know, it was sort of like, Ooh, wow. There's an amazing kernel at the center of this. And yet there were so many missed opportunities. 
that I thought, oh, how cool to do this and do it and fully explore these things and fully explore ASL and silent scenes and deaf culture and, and trying to portray that in an authentic way. And then also suddenly I went, oh, and they could be this family in Gloucester. I think in the original, they were this uh, dairy farmers in this small French village. And, and I thought, what is, what is the American version of that kind of working class, the dying working class, you know, livelihood. And, and I thought of Gloucester. And so I really, and then it was so alive to me, the idea that they could be this Italian fishing family in this town. I, um, I could see them. I could see who they were. I could see where they would live and, and what they were struggling with. And, um, and kind of, I knew I could make a really personal story within this story and could make it my own. And then there was a reason to make that film. And so it was exciting to me. And then also, I think I love projects that fully immerse you in an education about something, you know, and I think, you know, I wrote on Orange is the New Black for three seasons and lived in women's prison and, and talked to so many prisoners and, and had so many like amazing kind of insights into that system and how, you know, fucked up it was. And, and so I think it was, it was life-changing and opening as a human. And it always is for me when I dive into a project. And so, so I was very excited by this idea. Um, I was like, I want to learn ASL. I want to, you know, be in this community. I want to understand it. And I think whenever I see opportunities as a writer, to kind of really open up my world and my sense of what it's like to be someone else that I might not entertain otherwise, I think. So, so that was what I was most drawn to. And then, um, and spent a lot of time in that town while I was writing and hung out with those fishermen guys and went out on their boats with them and, you know, spent a lot of time in the deaf community and making deaf friends and, and understanding what that was. So, the, the spark of the story for me was, was the journey I knew it would take me on. And, and it did take me on that journey. You know, I tend to think of writing as so solitary and, and, and challenging and you all are making it actually sound really fun. I never said it was fun. No. I think <laughs> no one has to do it. doesn't mean it's fun. fun. Maggie had fun. I was like, where is that? Please show me the road. No, okay. no fun. No fun. <laughs> The research process for me, like using real people is both eye-opening research and also a complete procrastination tool because as Janix is like, like, I find it miserable sometimes to be writing. So I'm like, I know I should call the Coast Guard and I should talk <laughs> to the guy at the Coast Guard about how he would board a boat. That's a good use of my time right now instead of staring at the scene. So it, it can it can be both. It's a way of avoiding sitting in front of my laptop as well. Well, Janixa Zola is, you know, something that feels so alive and so fun while also being, you know, being, being a lot of things at once. And it's, and I don't know if this has ever been done. It's, it's kind of an adaptation of a Twitter thread. Where did, where did this even begin for you? Did you read the original thread? How did you come on this project? It is an adaptation of a Twitter thread. I, I don't know if it's the first time I've heard that many times, but I'd like to think that it's possible that I don't know all things, right? Uh, um, and that maybe someone did already make a movie like this, but it's a small movie from a small town and we just don't know about it. So perhaps this is the first at its, um, at its reception or scale. Uh, yes, it came out on Twitter in 2015. I read it the day it came out. It was written by this woman named Asia King. It's this harrowing story of uh, this three, four day weekend that she goes on from Detroit to Florida with the promise of making money and all things fall apart. Um, it, you know, I read it the day it came out and halfway through reading it, I knew it was going to be my, I felt it was going to be my second movie. I didn't know. I felt it was going to be my second movie. And at that point I hadn't even made a first movie, but I was like, this is my second movie. And I sent it to, to my agent and my manager. And I was like, this is my second movie. And I'm sure they were like, oh, this poor woman. Um, but, uh, but they did go after it as I asked them to. And, and there, there's another iteration of this film that involves 
the same producers, but another director, another set of writers. And, um, and I didn't get it because I wasn't sexy enough. And then a couple of years after that, so like around the top of 2017, I had actually made a first movie and, uh, and I found out it was available again and I went after it. And the thing that really sort of turned me on about it was the voice. I had never, never read a person like that. I mean, the woman who wrote it was 19 when she wrote it. And what was so radical to me was how she processed trauma. I mean, the piece is traumatizing. It's super funny. It is. It's very, very funny, but it's also really fucked up. And, uh, and the thing, you know, she's being robbed of her agency. She's being forced into sex slavery and, um, and it is funny, but, you know, between all of those jokes, there's something super uh, distressing. And I was attracted to it or drawn to it. I felt because I had to protect it. And I didn't think that anyone would do it the way that I would uh, and would go to the lengths, right? That it's protecting it, you know, from, from seed to sow. It's protecting that real person that uh, you're inviting into whatever this thing is that we all do, because, uh, you know, it's not the first time a real person's being used or some real person's story is being told, but I'm always, especially like in the last 10, 15 years, it's curious to me when real people become a part of the stories that we tell, but then it seems like they're dropped like at the end of a awards campaign or something, you know what I mean? I'm like, where's that guy? Oh, no one remembers them. You know, they're back to whatever horrible situation they came from. And I just felt like I'm going to be a part of this person's life for the rest of my life. As long as I am here, this person will be a part of me. I will always be there in some way. So I don't know that a lot of people would see it that way. I I think about that a lot, actually. It's, I I often wonder, you know, what becomes of these people. We don't hear of them, you know, once the movie is sort of left the end. And the filmmakers are not taking a task on, on the responsibility. Right. And I, and, and maybe look, we're not journalists, we're not surgeons, but I do think that, there is some responsibility to inviting someone in and taking from them. And that then you owe them, you owe them some degree of care that maybe goes on for longer than you're interested in. Right. It's like some, something around, I don't have a child, but I know some people here do. So it it feels like this kind of responsibility in some ways. I'm not saying it's like having a child. You guys understand, right? (laughs) Would you say identical? Uh, No, (laughs) not like having a child. (laughs) When you're you allowed to say that, you have a child, you can say that. <laughs> um, Rebecca, you're adapting. I didn't realize that Nella Larson's book was published in 1929. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just so it's, good. It's, it's, and it feels great. Book. Yeah, I've read it. Sure. 93 pages. It's an afternoon read. Get How- it, read it on Saturday. Yeah. I'm a slow reader, so maybe maybe an afternoon for you. <laughs> How did you first become aware of this novel, and what made you see it as cinematic? Uh, someone someone gave it to me um, quite randomly. I mean, not entirely randomly. I was I was talking to a group of people on a short film set, a very sort of you know sort of studenty short film situation. And I was chatting with a group of people and I was sort of saying, yeah, you know, I've, my, I've, I've yes, there's Peter Hall, but my, my mother's family is from Detroit, Michigan. And, you know, there's, it's, it's a really complicated and interesting family and I don't entirely get them. And I think they might be black actually, but they kind of pretend like they're white and I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know what that means or if that's kind of true even. And uh the next day one of the people that was in this short film was like have you heard of this book wow handed me this book and I remember very ignorantly looking at it and going passing what the hell does passing mean which is ironic given that I came from a family where people were passing (laughs) you know and it really took reading this book to have an emotional context for my in part my lived experience if I'm being completely honest like you know because I was raised by someone who was raised by someone who was living their life in hiding and the psychological toll of that is real Mm -hmm. and the what really blew my mind about the book was that as it pertains to race it was very specific to my experience but then I found that the book was so explosive in that 
it's sort of hooking you in with a racial narrative. It's telegraphing that's what it's about. And then it becomes about the cost of, of hiding, the cost of, of, of how much freedom any of us have to negotiate identity and how frightening it is to be free with who you want to be. And that felt very real to me and very potent and universal, you know? And I think that's, to this day, I think that's sort of what's astounding to white audiences who have never heard of Nella Larson. It's like, they sort of think it's a period film about, you know, it's about people of color in the twenties. So we're gonna get the history lesson and we know what that's about. And instead you're confronted with this very sort of open-ended universal question of like, well, what are you hiding about yourself? Yeah. And that's, I think, kind of radical, especially for something written in 1929. But you asked me, you know, what I saw cinematic about it, that it wasn't even, I don't think I was even conscious that I was mm -hmm. uh, seeing what was cinematic about it. But as I was reading it, the movie, in some cases, as it came out, was playing in my head from the moment I read the first mm -hmm. iteration of the book. And I just immediately sat down and started writing the screenplay because there was no other way to get the image the movie in my head out of my head and somewhere else so it was always cinematic to me can i ask a geeky question when you were seeing the movie in your head was it in black and white yeah oh, i was gonna ask a question like that <laughs> Wait, can i add to it as you answer that course, mine wasn't course. about the palette mine was more about what do you what, as you were writing it and i'm curious for everyone as they're writing and and we all see images, of course, that make sense. But like our images, do images include people or are they spaces? Are they light? Are they color? I'm curious what it was like for you, especially because your film is in black and white. Mm -hmm. So what what you were seeing as you were writing? I mean, it was black and white. There were there were faces. I don't think it was specific as sort of period costumes. I think I was a bit kind of probably vague on that front. There was no period detail, but there were people. And there were definitely shots, like a lot of the tea room scene, for example, when they first meet each other, the sort of the sort of play on her having this moment of wirism and seeing other people in the room and the kind of oasis, weird atmosphere of that room, the sound of that room, that was all very present. That's so interesting because that scene feels like almost like a dream. Yes. You no, know, and then other parts of the movie have a more kind of reality or solidity in them, but that one in particular, I mean, there's other parts also that feel dreamy, but that it really in particular almost feels like a memory or. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's kind of, that was the hope, but that was, very, that was, that was one of those ones that, you know, you get those ones that are just very clear in your head for whatever reason. That was definitely yeah. one of them. Yeah. Maggie, for you, you're you're adapting the Elena Ferrante Elena Ferrante novel, The Lost Daughter. Um, it's not a book that I think people would automatically think could be cinematic, and it's it's so amazing that you have been able to translate it to screen. How did you come across it, and and you know when did you sort of realize that you could make this in another medium? I relate, Rebecca, to what you were saying in that, like, um, I often when I read books, I kind of see them as films, not like, oh, this is the next film I want to make or but just I I'm used to making that translation from something written to something cinematic because that's our job as actors. And um, and then often it'll fall away. You know, I'll be like, oh, no, actually, no, no, this can't be a movie. This lives in some other world. Um, and I think with Ferrante, <clears throat> I read a, a whole a lot of other books by her first, and I was really stunned by um, how uncompromisingly honest she is, not just about um, mothering, which is a big part of uh, my film, but also about just in general, being a woman in the world, being a lover, being a thinker, being an artist. Um, she says things that we have agreed not to talk about. And, and I think to the degree to which I, I, things we've sort of agreed not to even consciously think about. And when I read them written down, I was um, really electrified by seeing them, by hearing them articulated. And I thought, um, I don't know if I thought this immediately, but eventually I thought, well, I knew I wanted to adapt it. And I guess I had to think about why, because I had to appeal to her for the rights. And as I was writing the note to a, the letter, which I, I really spent, it was another example of, of a place where writing illuminated to me what my thinking was. Um, I realized that uh, 
yeah, the reason that I wanted to to adapt it and put it on screen is because in some ways, all of us alone in our rooms reading these books, I was not alone in being moved by how truthful she was. Her books were flying off the shelves. All of us alone reading these truthful things is still a way of keeping it hidden and secret. And and although it was comforting to me to know that another woman out there had the same some of similar feelings to ones that I had hidden, um, I thought, what if you put it on screen? What if you actually heard the thing spoken out loud? Then the cat is really out of the bag. Then there's no putting it back in. And also, what if you make it a communal experience? I mean, yes, my film is on Netflix, but it's also available to watch in a theater where you can sit. Well, anyway, even on Netflix, you can sit next to your mother or your husband or your daughter and watch this movie. And then what happens to the, it's, you know, it's, it's really a communal, um, you know, like you just used the word radical. I thought that would be radical. Like, like what happens then to the, um, to the agreements we've made about keeping silent about certain things. So for me, yeah, that was what turned me on about it. And I, and I think all the way through, I had this feeling kind of also, um, Janixa, like you were saying, like, it was my, I had been given something really valuable when I read those books and I felt it was my responsibility to take something really valuable and really delicate and bring it over into this other form. And I could so easily, because the things that she's saying are so specific and so particular, um, it'd be really easy to, to um, say something else by mistake. Yeah. And and I just it was really, really important not to do that. Even if some people hear you saying something else, that's OK. I mean, that's on them, really. You know, that's that's OK. That's beautiful, too. But it was important to me that I felt what I was putting out was the very specific, delicate thing or things I wanted to say. Mm. And uh, Christy, a uh, little different from the rest of the group, because you wrote an original screenplay for one night in Soho. And I'm always curious, it's it's almost a cliche question, so forgive me, but uh, there's so much going on in this movie. What was the initial spark or idea that, that set the film in motion? Well, I mean, Edgar came to me with the story and, and didn't come to me as a writer, like came to me as a friend um, because he knew that I had lived in Soho and I worked in a bar and I lived above a strip club and I had no money and I was a struggling student slash trying to be a writer. And I suppose when we first met and had those conversations, he was like, you know what it's like to live in the CD awful parts of Soho. And I was like, yes, thank you for reminding me. I, I know that really, really well. And so when he first told me the story, it was more just a sort of like a sounding word. It's like, what do you, is this believable? Like, what do you think? And, you know, he actually told me it in like this dingy basement bar where we were surrounded by the sex trade. Do you know what I mean? Like Soho in London, the nightlife is partly kind of, you know, a lot of famous actors, directors, writers, producers, and then also, you know, this seedy underbelly. And, and I had sort of lived in both sides of it. And um, when he asked me to to collaborate and to come on and write it with him, I, I kind of I wrestled with it for like about a day because I thought, well, you know, this is a story that he really has. Like, what am I going to bring to it? And then I realized, you know, like you, Shan, I love to like cannibalize people's lives. Like I love to I love to get in amongst there. I love to like understand them and go out and speak with them. And I realized that I had been doing the research for this film, you know, all of my 20s. Like I had spent 10 years researching this movie and it was a part of my life that I never thought I would get to put on screen because it's kind of messy. It's complicated. It's what it's like to be, you know, 22 years old and wandering through a big city in which you're like, I'm not entirely safe. And if I make the wrong choices, the wrong things will happen to me. And so to get to then kind of, I don't know, exercise those demons of being young and lost felt like a really lovely thing for me to give myself. Um, so it, it started off as, a, as like, as I mean, as, as you guys have said as well, it was like, it was a total gift to be given this story to play in. And then also, I, you know, the apartment I lived in above a strip club, my next door neighbor in the past was Karl Marx. And like, that's what London is. Like all of London is just, you know, Jimi Hendrix, there's a blue pack opposite where I used to live. And you, you can't kind of live in London and stay in any of these places without lying awake at night and going like, who's been in this room? Like who's been in my bed? What's happened in here? 
And I, I, I lived above a strip club and not a nice strip club. And so like terrible things had happened in that room and it used to keep me awake. And so when Edgar kind of presented this idea of like the past haunting you, I was like, oh, oh, I'm all over that. I'm like, just give me 15 minutes alone in a room and I'll tell you some horrific stories. Um, so, yeah, so that was I was I was very much it was a gift that was given to me and that I had accidentally researched by so happened to being a, a poor young woman. <laughs> Well, I actually want to ask you, and I want to ask this of everyone, but this, you, this, you know, I think movie feels so authentic. And now I, you know, I know why, because you did live it, um, you know, and because they're all so original, how, how did you keep it that way? Were there certain elements or tropes you knew you wanted to avoid, especially in the genre, which, you know, I think we've seen done a lot and sometimes not very well, um, you know, with female characters. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think with anything, originality sort of resides in the people that are making it. Because I think you can make you can take a, an incredibly generic story and and by narrowing it, by kind of really putting yourself and your collaborators into, it, I think you get something profound. I think with this, we almost wanted to play on some of the tropes. Yeah. So like we watched all those kind of films, you know, from the sixties all the way up, and like these ideas of like, oh yeah, and it's always and she's always murdered, and this is how it plays out. And and we used the idea that everyone would just assume that the poor girl that fell into the sex trade would of course be killed at the midpoint of the film. Like obviously that happens in every other movie. And so that's that kind of those stereotypes massively helped us and and helped just be a red herring and cover up our kind of like evil machinations. <laughs> what about for the rest of you? Were there elements or tropes you either wanted to feed into or, or, or avoid? And I'll ask Janixa because y- your movie is so unpredictable. Even having read the Twitter thread, I was just excited to see where it was going to go. Yeah, I feel like uh, Chrissy was saying, I think that there are tropes that are expected and you lean into those and they can sort of benefit you in a way, you know, Uh, There's this one section of Zola where there is, it's a sex montage and it's, uh, it's a sort of, uh, what would you call it? Like a, like a, a galley of, of suitors um, Mm -hmm. who've all purchased sex. And uh, I visited my DP and I, Ari and, and our production designer, we, we watched independently, not together, <laughs> films in which this kind of thing happens. And uh, my relationship to it was that you kind of set it up like you have a sense that the audience, the audience feels it's going to be really, some portion of the audience feels it's going to be sexy for them and some portion of the audience feels it's going to be really dangerous for them or distressing. And then it is, but I think not in the way that you expect, right? I think that uh, I felt when I was making this movie, I wanted to make this movie for Janixa at 17. It's like, what's the movie that you're not exactly old enough to see, but that you could try to sneak into. And, and if I sat and saw Zola at 17 years old, it would have totally blown my mind. And that's not, I'm, I realized them like, because it's so good. Cause I did such a good job. No, <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that like the places that it goes is uh, not expected and that there's a black woman at the center of it, right. Guiding it. And, and that you're dealing with sex and sex work in a way that the women are still in control of it. And you get to see penises like this just was not my experience as a teenager. Right. Like whenever I saw movies I wasn't supposed to see, it was men steering and and women in this sort of beta. And and that I just think if I'd gotten to see that, perhaps I would have arrived at being a director sooner. Perhaps I would have arrived at being a writer sooner and that being able, you know, what's radical I'm going to go back to the word radical and fantastic about this panel is that we're all different, right? Like that there are five women here who have made movies that are like uh, all from totally different planets. Right. And um, I, I'm going to assume, I think we're like relatively all in a similar age range, you know, and that like, we did not get to grow up with this panel, you know, when we were teenagers, this panel didn't exist. And like, that is just, so special. And I really feel that I'm really feeling that in this moment, getting to be in the company of these women and that there are other fucking stellar women making shit today, you know? 
Yeah, and that it looks that different. wasn't your question, but that is what it was. It, it was okay. and more. So I thank you, actually. <laughs> I think also, I really do think when women make movies, and like you said, all of our movies look so different and, and are really different, but they are women, I do think, make movies that look different than men. We have a different expression. We open spaces up that I think haven't been explored all that much, you know? And that's compelling to people, I think, to see something new, something new that's truthful and honest and that you haven't seen before. Which is so much what The Lost Daughter is. Like I've said, I I can't believe people are actually saying these things that, you know, I've heard my friends whisper. Um, So I don't know if there are really tropes that you had to avoid. And, And you're kind of doing the opposite. You're kind of well, I have, I have both. I think I agree with you. We play with tropes also. And oh my God, is she, is she lost? And, you know, like the, the thriller kind of like, old, like sort of traditional thriller, even horror a little bit um, mm-hmm. tropes. And uh, I think those really serve us um, in an interesting way to sort of make people feel comfortable and think you're going down this road and then actually, well, no, we're going over here. Um, I think that we, we, I used that for sure, but I did have a trope that I really was really important to me not to fall into, um, which was that I I really think that Leda could not be crazy. I think that there's all sorts of movies. Um, I've said this before, but I realized in talking about my film that there's all these interesting movies, really good movies, like movies that all of us probably love. Um, about crazy women. There's some kind of um, interest, like almost like a kind of porn, I think, in watching really formidable, interesting women go crazy. Um, And my film really wouldn't work like that because if she's crazy, um, I think it gives everyone an out. It lets you say, well, she's mentally ill. So in fact, uh, this is nothing like me. I'm such a good mama. This is the, these are the acts of someone who's, who's, who's got an illness, as opposed to, can you be brave enough to consider the ways in which, even though these things are painful, dark, perverse, full of shame, um, you know, really on the edges of um, what we're willing to bear. And even though this is somebody who has probably caused, you know, who has definitely caused uh, almost unbearable pain, both to herself and to her children, that she, that you could relate to her, that this is the act of someone who is, sane. Um, And that in fact, in our normal experience, even things as complicated and really on the edges as this can exist. Um, So I just really, really knew I didn't want her to be crazy. And Sean, I've told you this before, but I I love in CODA how messy your characters are allowed to be. And I also love that you have a longtime married couple who can't keep their hands off each other. I can't remember the last time I saw that. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think I really, really actually to what Chrissy was saying too about like leaning into some of the tropes because I I was like, I, I wanted to make a classic coming of age that, that had a familiar structure that people could relax into to be open to the specificity of what was happening within these scenes. I, this was not a movie where it was like, oh my God, what's going to happen to Ruby, you know, is is she going to get murdered at the end? Like, is it, you know, like I, it was not, I think, you know, where the movie's going in a way, but that, that allows an audience to live in the details and in the messiness of the family. And in, um, I think not only the specificity of deaf culture, but of these characters, you know, and, and they're messy. The tension in the movie is, how complicated familial relationships are, you know, and how these little tensions and these things that pull on us and and messy, flawed characters and, and what it's like to be an older brother who, who's been kind of disenfranchised within your own family, because, you know, you, you're not looked to, to, to do what you're capable of because you've got this hearing sister, like all these kind of things that are under the surface and buried and find their way out. Um, and as Maggie said, I think if there was one trope I, I really wanted to look at was like how disability has been presented on film and how these characters have been presented. And as you mentioned, sex, like like disability has been, you know, has become asexual in, in a lot of 
the way it's been presented. And I think disabled characters are often um, kind of either either objects of pity or or so noble. Um, and I think this is true of a lot of marginalized groups. Like it's it's the noble version of the character where it's like this person's so good and pure and you know somehow elevated beyond normal human. And I think what I really wanted to do is normalize these characters. This is a couple that really likes to fuck each other, like and 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 is very open about their sex life. And and you know I think. My parents were like that. My parents were entirely inappropriate and shared way too much in front of my friends. And, and I, you know, I grew up in this house where I was constantly like, oh my God, like, why are we, you know, my mom thinks it's funny to like fold her fancy dinner napkin into like a penis and then make it become erect in front of my friend. Like what is happening? But I think I could kind of take all those little nuances and like weird details from my own family and imbue these characters with that. And and present something which was very foreign to audiences, you know, present ASL, you know, purely silent scenes where, where there was no spoken dialogue and you were just purely living in a visual space of language and, and noticing um, all of the little details within deaf culture, whether it's waving in someone's face when you need their attention or stomping on the floor. Or, like I was just interested in the granular of this family. And I think that, that familiar structure, I kind of knew where I was going. I knew an audience would know where we were going. And that made people feel like they could open themselves up to this very unfamiliar experience of, of this specific family. Nice. And Rebecca, for you, you, you are showing a world that I don't think many people, you know, know about, think about, um, going into that. What, what, what did you know that you wanted to show on screen, um, and how you wanted to tell your story? Oh, is, is this a different question? This isn't the no, same. No, it's, it's me question. rewording the same same. question. Yeah, okay. in a fancy way. <laughs> I was all ready to get into the tropes question. You did so the like, homework. Oh. You're like, damn it. I was trying to think of a word <laughs> other than <laughs> trope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the, I suppose the, you know, the thing about passing is that it's, you know, it's essentially a story about the confines and the rigidity of performance. And it's not really, you know, it's not the obvious one who's pretending to be white. It's the one who's sort of, you know. So yes, there, there are plenty tropes, whether it's everything from like straight up Hitchcock psychological thriller to, you know, more T. Vicar in an Austin novel, you know, repressed brief encounters kind of world. <laughs> there's there's all of it. You know, there's the Tennessee Williams-esque heroine. There's the kind of, but then, you know, it's it's presenting all of that and then showing what's underneath the performance quietly and also making the performance part of it. So in a sense, the film, I mean, the film had its own performance. So all of the tropes, of, it's in dialogue with certain cinematic tropes of thriller, of black and white film, of, you know, all of these things that are that are that are rigid and performative and and confining on some level so the hope is that you start to see the messiness of humanity spill out the sides and that's what you're left with were there specific films that you watched or you wanted your cast to watch before you shot yeah there were there were a lot of films that I thought about um a lot of films that I thought about but I didn't I don't think I would ever tell a cast to watch yeah. other films I mean there were definitely things that I that were in my sort of um, awareness. There's a, you know, there was certain shadow of a doubt was kind oh. of an important one for various reasons. Um, also there's a Joseph Losey film called The Servant, which is not, it's, it's a uh, scripted by Harold Pinter actually. And it, is set inside a house and it's extremely claustrophobic and it's really about class and power. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of servant takes over the master's life and there's this weird kind of, it's very destabilizing and scary. And, but that film was very present for me. Um, and I, I don't know, a ton of other ones. A ton I, of just, other, ones really, ones. I never, I can't believe Tennessee Williams never clicked for me until you said it right now, but. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't tell my actors to go and watch anything. I did say to Ruth sort of kind of casually, maybe reread Streetcar Named Desire, just, yeah. you know, just for fun. Wow. And by the way, Nella Larson wrote that before. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I knew this was going to happen because I have so many questions and you're all so wonderful and we are out of time. Um, but I want to thank you so, so much for joining us today. I want to remind everyone that I think all these movies are available now to stream. They can be seen. Um, and again, I want to thank you really for, for putting together some of the best movies of the year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. for having us.